feisty, fearless, and fair. She's an Emmy-winning journalist from the White House to war zones, telling all sides of the story. This is the Rita Cosby Show. And this hour on the Rita Cosby Show, we are talking about this bombshell release coming from Jack Smith. And also, the debate last night. What did you think? Uh, Why were they so focused on January 6th last night? Maybe they got a tip-off of this leak today. Uh, The DOJ saying to the judge that Trump must stand trial, uh, that this is terrible for Trump. And yet it is all just filled with allegations and nonsense, and a lot of it will never see the light of day. And you can bet again, if Trump gets into office, the first thing he's going to do is get rid of Jack Smith on day one. And I say bravo to that because that guy has been so politicized and has just become, uh, he's destroyed the thought of a special counsel. No one's ever going to trust a special counsel in the future because of the way he's acted. What about A.G. Garland? He hasn't acted unbiased. He has been the most politically charged attorney general I've ever seen. And that's a dangerous place to be. By the way, Eric Adams has now hired on his defense team. You remember, he's dealing with the indictments coming from the U.S. attorney. And again, it comes after he complained about the migrant crisis in New York and the cost and asking for the feds to help and the feds to seal the border. Finally, he started complaining about it. And guess what happens? Uh, They raid his fundraiser's location. The next thing you know, he's got this indictment. Well, he hired just recently an attorney who was appointed as U.S. attorney by President Trump. So he's sort of looking at getting some of these folks who have been defending President Trump. Remember, President Trump not that long ago came out and defended Eric Adams and said, listen, I said, A year ago when he was speaking out against the White House, Joe Biden, that Joe Biden wasn't going to be happy about him complaining about the migrant crisis in New York City. And a year later, he would be indicted. Well, lo and behold, Trump was right. A year later, Eric Adams is indicted. Also, Eric Adams is getting some help. Uh, Today, he had support from a whole bunch of Hispanic business owners. Um, And they essentially came to a market in Washington Heights in New York And they showed their support for Eric Adams. It's interesting to see sort of the different sides that are coming together uh, aligning for or against Eric Adams. Now, this is interesting. Jose Alba, we've talked about him on the show. He is the guy who was the bodega clerk, remember, who was attacked by that brute and the girlfriend who came behind the counter. Remember the guy cornered Jose Alba in, the woman stabbing him. Jose Alba had to defend himself, and the guy was killed. Well, Jose Alba, remember, then got charged with murder charges, which was preposterous. So now Jose Alba was among the people now coming to Eric Adams' defense, which is very interesting. He says, quote, I came to support Eric Adams because when I had my problem, Adams was there to support. How powerful that he says in that 2022 stabbing at that bodega in Harlem that Eric Adams was there and was fair to me and was fighting for my rights. Jose Alba coming out and now returning the favor for Eric Adams saying, I don't believe he's guilty. I want him found innocent. Very powerful statements and people rallying for Eric Adams. And again, President Trump rallying and saying, you know what, Uh, this is crazy kind of what's happening to Eric Adams. And again, President Trump dealing with his own incoming. What would a different day be without more incoming coming against President Trump? I want to play the comment because this just came in again a little bit ago. Trump responding to this DOJ released by the special counsel, which says he, quote, resorted to crimes to try to stay in office Again, tied to January 6th, but they're rehashing whatever they can. And here is Trump reacting to it. 
We know that Special Counsel Jack Smith had filed court documents calling your actions in the aftermath of the 2020 election, quote, a private criminal effort. Can you respond to that? Uh, he's a deranged person. I call him deranged Jack Smith. He just lost the big documents case. That was the biggest of them all. They said the documents case. And they said that was the toughest of them all. Let me tell you, we just won it. And it was won strongly and completely. And it was a total victory in Florida. And he is a person who is trying and, and he works for Kamala and he works for Joe. This was a weaponization of government and that's why it was released 30 days before the election. And it's nothing new in there, by the way. Nothing new. They rigged the election. I didn't rig the election. They should have never allowed the information to be to come before the public. But they did that because they want to hurt you in, with the election. It's pure election interference to get an incompetent person like Kamala. She's grossly incompetent. She's more incompetent than Biden to get these people elected. And yet, during the debate last night, they couldn't wait to talk about January 6th, and they glossed over all that stuff about Tim Walz in China. They did ask him about one of his inconsistencies, one of his many, but they essentially gave him a free pass. Uh, and I wish they had spent a lot more time because that's a serious issue. January 6th, give me a break. We have seen so much bias and so much misrepresentation on that. And yet, last night during the debate, they went for that. They, of course, did go to the inconsistency with Tim Walz, but barely covered it. And listen to that. Who can forget that mumbling, fumbling answer? Uh, His connections to China, I think, are a lot more serious than this uh, hogwash of recasting January 6th yet again. Here is that exchange last night where they did ask Walz about why he was in China. And remember, he's just a knucklehead. Governor Walz. You said you were in Hong Kong during the deadly Tiananmen Square protests in the spring of 1989. But Minnesota Public Radio and other media outlets are reporting that you actually didn't travel to Asia until August of that year. Can you explain that discrepancy? Your yeah, comments? well, and to the folks out there who didn't get at the top of this, look, I, uh, I grew up in small rural Nebraska, a uh, town of 400, town that you rode your bike with your buddies till the street lights come on, and I'm proud of that service. I joined the National Guard at 17, worked on family farms, and then I used the GI Bill to become a teacher, passionate about it, a young teacher. Uh, my first year out, I got the opportunity in the summer of 89 uh, to travel to China. 35 years ago, be able to do that. I came back home and then started a program to take young people there. We would take basketball teams, we would take baseball teams, we would take dancers, and we would go back and forth to China. The issue for that was, was to try and learn. Now look, my community knows who I am. They saw where I was at. They. Look, I I will be the first to tell you, I have poured my heart into my community. I've tried to do the best I can, but I've not been perfect. And I'm a knucklehead at times, but it's always been about that. Those same people elected me to Congress for 12 years. And in Congress, I was one of the most bipartisan people working on things like farm bills that we got done, working on veterans benefits. And then the people of Minnesota were able to elect me to governor twice. So look, my commitment has been from the beginning to make sure that I'm there for the people, to make sure that I get this right. I will say more than anything, many times I uh, I will talk a lot, I will get caught up in the rhetoric, um, but being there, the impact it made, the difference it made in my life, I learned a lot about China. I hear the critiques of this. I would make the case that Donald Trump should have come on one of those trips with us. I guarantee you he wouldn't be uh, praising Xi Jinping about COVID, and I guarantee you he wouldn't start a trade war that he ends up losing. So this is about trying to understand the world. It's about trying to do the best you can for your community, and then it's putting yourself out there and letting your folks understand what it is. My commitment, whether it be through teaching, which I was good at, or whether it was being a good soldier or was being a good member of Congress, those are the things that I think are the values that people care about. Governor, just to follow up on that, the question was, can you explain the no, discrepancy? Just, all I said on this was, is I got there that summer and misspoke on this. So I, I will just, that's what I've said. So I was in Hong Kong and China during the democracy protests went in. And from that, I learned a lot of what needed to be in in governance. Uh, I lied. And can we just move on? And the moderator did after that, as opposed to saying, I want to understand the nature of your relationship. 
Uh, what about why you allowed Minneapolis to burn? Uh, why, when you sent the National Guard and you disparaged the National Guard? Uh, there are so many questions that should have been asked that are much more serious. And yet the moderators last night seeming to know that this was coming out today, this new filing by Jack Smith being made public by the judge, seemingly ended their debate talking about January 6th. Let's bring back that moment. Senator Vance, you have said you would not have certified the last presidential election and would have asked the states to submit alternative electors. That has been called unconstitutional and illegal. Would you again seek to challenge this year's election results, even if every governor certifies the results? I'll give you two minutes. Well, Nora, first of all, I think that we're focused on the future. We need to figure out how to solve the inflation crisis caused by Kamala Harris's policies, make housing affordable, make groceries affordable. And that's what we're focused on. But I want to answer your question because you did ask it. Look, what President Trump has said is that there were problems in 2020. And my own belief is that we should fight about those issues, debate those issues peacefully in the public square. And that's all I've said. And that's all that Donald Trump has said. Remember, he said that on January the 6th, the protesters ought to protest peacefully. And on January the 20th, what happened? Joe Biden became the president. Donald Trump left the White House. And now, of course, unfortunately, we have all of the negative policies that have come from the Harris Biden administration. I believe that we actually do have a threat to democracy in this country, but unfortunately, it's not the threat to democracy that Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz want to talk about. It is the threat of censorship. It's Americans casting aside lifelong friendships because of disagreements over politics. It's big technology companies silencing their fellow citizens. And it's Kamala Harris saying that rather than debate and persuade her fellow Americans, she'd like to censor people who engage in misinformation. I think that is a much bigger threat to democracy than anything that we've seen in this country in the last four years, in the last 40 years. Now, I'm really proud, especially given that I was raised by two lifelong blue collar Democrats, to have the endorsement of Bobby Kennedy. Jr. and Tulsi Gabbard, lifelong leaders in the Democratic coalition. And of course, they don't agree with me and Donald Trump on every issue. We don't have to agree on every issue, but we're united behind a basic American First Amendment principle that we ought to debate our differences. We ought to argue about them. We ought to try to persuade our fellow Americans. Kamala Harris is engaged in censorship at an industrial scale. She did it during COVID. She's done it over a number of other issues. And that, to me, is a much bigger threat to democracy than what Donald Donald Trump said when he said that protesters should peacefully protest on January the 6th. And then Tim Walz responded also. Remember this one. But tonight's debate, and I think there was a lot of commonality here, and I'm I'm sympathetic to misspeaking on things, and I think I might have with uh, with the senator. Me me too, man. There's one. There's one, though, that this this one is troubling to me. And I say that because I, I think we need to tell the story. Donald Trump refused to acknowledge this. And the fact is, is that I don't think we can be the frog in the pot and let the boiling water go up. He was very clear. I mean, he lost this election and he said he didn't. 140 police officers were beaten at the Capitol that day, some with the American flag, several later died. And it wasn't just in there. In Minnesota, a group gathered on the state Capitol grounds in St. Paul and said, we're marching to the governor's residence and there may be casualties. The only person there was my son and his dog who was rushed out crying by state police. That issue and Mike Pence standing there as they were chanting, hang Mike Pence. Mike Pence made the right decision. So, Senator, it was adjudicated over and over and over. I worked with kids long enough to know, and I said as a football coach, sometimes you really want to win, but the democracy is bigger than winning an election. You shake hands and then you try and do everything you can to help the other side win. That's that's what was at stake here. Now, the thing I'm most concerned about is the idea that imprisoning your your political opponents already laying the groundwork for people not accepting this. And a president's words matter. A president's words matter. People hear that. So I think this issue of settling our differences at the ballot box shaking hands when we lose being honest about it, but to deny what happened. On January 6th, the first time in American history that a president or anyone tried to overturn a fair election and the peaceful transfer of power. And here we are four years later in the same boat. I will tell you this, that when this is over, we need to shake hands this election and the winner needs to be the winner. This has got to stop. It's tearing our country apart. 
And by the way, then remember, Walls also said, uh, that's the reason that you're here and not Mike Pence uh, because of all of this stuff. That was, by the way, another opportunity where I actually think when he said that, Vance should have looked at him and said, you really want to talk about threats to democracy? What about the 14 million people who voted for Joe Biden in the primary and then the old switcheroo forced him out? And if that was the case, I, J.D. Vance, would be debating Kamala Harris, not you, Tim Walz. That would have been brilliant. 1-800-848-9222. We'll take your calls when we come back. You're listening to The Rita Cosby Show. This is The Rita Cosby Show. Well, maybe that's how J.D. Vance feels today because, boy, he clearly won that debate. And last night, Tim Waltz had a lot of doozies of a line. This one, I couldn't believe he said this, and he should be getting hammered left and right for this one. Who could forget this one-liner? Senator, thank you. Governor, you previously opposed an assault weapons ban, but it's only later in your political career did you change your position. Why? Yeah, I sat in that office with those Sandy Hook parents. I've become friends with school shooters. I've seen it. Look, the NRA, I was an NRA guy for a long time. They used to teach gun safety. I'm of an age where my shotgun was in my car so I could pheasant hunt after football practice. I've become friends with school shooters. Uh, that's where the moderators should have said, excuse me, when he said it, my jaw dropped. I was listening to it live. I was like, I couldn't believe he said that. He obviously misspoke. And I wish Vance or the moderators had seized on that one because, boy, uh, that was a horrible misstatement. This guy is not ready for prime time. And that is why today there's this document drop going back to the old January 6 mantra. Uh, let's go to Jacqueline. Uh, Jacqueline, your thoughts about this? First of all, um, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Okay. First of all, J.D. did as well as he could be expected to do last night, if not better, given the fact that it was three against one again. However, he was a little bit more prepared for it. I mean, Trump was just sort of like trying not to say anything wicked about Camilla. So I understand he was a little held back. Yeah, and on this one, go ahead, Jack, and we just have a few seconds. Just have a few seconds. Please remember one thing, and that most people are not understanding here, how they're using this January 6th takeover. The Democrats, under uh, Pelosi and Schiff and all the rest of them, they are just recreating what happened with Hitler in the Reichstag takeover. Yeah, you, there's sort of, I hear what you're saying, sort of this indoctrination, spreading false testimony. Cosby is on. Well, there were certainly some highlights and lowlights in the debate last night. And I would say Tim Waltz had many lowlights. I mean, it was a horrible debate for him. It was horrible. And not only that, he just doesn't look like he is ready to be anywhere near the Oval Office. Remember, the vice president uh, is a heartbeat away. And this guy just seemed all over the place. He seemed like he was trying to remember lines that they gave him because probably what he really thinks can't get out there because he, I think, is even more to the left than Kamala Harris. And yet he was fumbling and bumbling, and it started at the very beginning of the debate. Here's his very first answer, and he couldn't keep track of whether it's Israel or Iran. I mean, this guy is not ready for prime time. Governor Walls, if you were the final voice in the Situation Room, would you support or oppose a preemptive strike by Israel on Iran. You have two minutes. Well, thank you. And thank you for those joining at home tonight. Uh, Let's keep in mind where this started. October 7th, Hamas terrorists uh, 
massacred over 1,400 Israelis and took prisoners. Uh, Iran, or I, uh, Israel's ability to be able to defend itself is absolutely fundamental. Getting its uh, hostages back, fundamental. And ending the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. But the expansion of Israel and its proxies is an absolute <coughs> fundamental uh, necessity for the United States to have the steady leadership there. You saw it experienced today, where along with our uh, Israeli partners and our coalition, able to stop the incoming uh, attack. But what's fundamental here is <coughs> that steady leadership is going to matter. It's clear, and the world saw it on that debate stage a few weeks ago, a nearly 80-year-old Donald Trump talking about crowd sizes is not what we need in this moment. But it's not just that. It's those that were closest to Donald Trump that understand how dangerous he is when the world is this dangerous. His chief of staff, John Kelly, said that he was the most flawed human being he'd ever met. And both of his secretaries of defense and his national security advisors said he should be nowhere near the White House. Now, the person closest to them, the, to the Donald Trump, said he's unfit for the highest office. That was Senator Vance. What we've seen out of Vice President Harris is we've seen steady leadership. We've seen a calmness that is able to be able to draw on the coalitions to bring them together. Understanding that our allies matter. When our allies see Donald Trump turn towards Vladimir Putin, turn towards uh, North Korea, when we start to see that type of fickleness around holding the coalitions together, we will stay committed. And as the vice president said today is, we will protect our forces and our allied forces and there will be consequences. First of all, there are so many lies in that answer. I don't even know where to start. Uh, if anybody thinks that Kamala Harris is tough and that people out there in the world uh, like Iran and others are worried about Kamala Harris, that just belies the facts. They clearly do not want Donald Trump in office because he's the guy who took out Soleimani and he is the guy who will be tough against Iran. These folks are still discussing whether or not to put sanctions on Iran. It is pathetic. It is pathetic what this administration has done to put us in such incredible danger, not just Israel, but the world in danger. It was so obvious how bad he was. You heard he couldn't even remember. Is it Israel? Is it Iran? Uh, this guy was horrible, which is, again, why I think uh, tonight there was this document dump of all this information trying to smear Donald Trump back to the old January 6th playbook because they got nothing else. And they will do anything, I believe, to smear him. Donald Trump also is saying that he believes also that they are restricting the number of secret service he can have so he can't do huge events because he doesn't have enough protection. Guess who allocates the protection? It's the White House. They claim that they're trying to restrict certain areas to him for his own protection. He believes they're doing it because they want to restrict the events. Either way, uh, why are they playing around with his protection? I'll just say it. They'll do anything to win. To me, this is scary stuff, and it's dangerous stuff, and it's election interference on so many horrible, horrible levels. But Tim Walz was so bad last night in the debate, and I think he did hurt Kamala Harris. I thought he would do better, you guys. Before the debate, I thought, look, a guy who's been in office since 2006 in terms of being in Congress and then moving on to the governorship, I thought it would have been better. He seemed like a little more of a smoother talker. On the, you know, when he was at the DNC, it seemed like he was a little bit better at the Democratic National Convention, but he was so blathering and so bad. And then again, saying his, he has friends who are school shooters, which he clearly, I assume, didn't mean. I mean, this guy is so incompetent and so far to the left. It's dangerous for America. And it was so bad that even ABC News's Jonathan Carl weighed in. Look what he had to say about Walt's right after the debate. You know, but but first, David, I, I got to say, I think that, that Walls did seem unsteady. And frankly, what I saw in Walls is somebody who has not faced questions on a national stage since he became the Democratic nominee. He was simply out, out of practice. I mean, they, I don't know why they've done it, but they've kept him uh, out of the limelight. They've kept him away from reporters. They haven't had him do any interviews. And he was clearly unsteady through much of that debate. And in contrast, J.D. Vance was very smooth. He took the arguments not to Walls. He was very respectful of Walls, uh, took it to Kamala Harris. And I thought J.D. Vance was masterful. 
And here's a little more of the media reaction. Listen to most of them on MSNBC, some of them making excuses again for Walsh. Yeah. And I actually yeah. think if you're a woman, that might be the, the worst moment J.D. Vance had because he was going to mansplain right over that mute button. Um, he was, uh, and again, I don't pretend to know how everyone will react to this. I think that a lot of women um, in positions of authority that should command respect just by virtue of that dynamic will see themselves and some do that just disrespected them and talked over, uh, you know, I, I mean, there was a moment like that with, with the vice presidential in the Harris-Pence uh, debate. That one of these candidates is much slicker than the other, is a much more practiced kind of professional debate style speaker, and the other candidate won. Um, there was one bad moment for Tim Walls in this debate where he got mixed up and embarrassed in answering a question about exactly what month he had been in China in relation to the Tiananmen Square protest. It seems to me um, if the goal is to make Tim Waltz your neighbor, your Midwest neighbor, right. a nice guy, actually, uh, despite all the things we're saying this morning, it's mission accomplished. And Tim Waltz got exactly what he needed out of this. And so did uh, Kamala Harris. We talked about this a little bit when we were sitting over there waiting. I think Tim Walls is one of the best communicators out there in Democratic politics. And he was he propelled himself onto the ticket because he is such an effective, good communicator. You got to be kidding me. He's such a great communicator. And if he wasn't good, it's because he's not slick. Uh, What about because his policies stink and he's not telling the truth? He wasn't even answering truthfully on that whole thing with China. That was just such a disaster. But they know it was bad. You even heard Jonathan Carl at ABC News, which isn't exactly Trump-friendly territory. They know it's bad. They know it's fumbly-bumbly. And that's why I contend suddenly this comes out today to try to undermine President Trump. 1-800-848-9222. Let's go to Susan. Line four. Susan, your thoughts. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so I want to go back to... And Rita, I'm so glad to talk to you. I think you were just like you were so terrific last night against uh, some of the opposition that was just like blah, blah. Uh, Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you. (laughs) I like setting the record straight. (laughs) Yeah, you're 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 our little uh, uh, warrior. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you very much. You're a sweetheart. Thank you. Yeah. No, but what I wanted to say was, um, back to Walls, uh, he, he did get some blurbs in there, and I really want to hear from you because, uh, you know, we're just like listening, but didn't he say something about January 6th? Did he say 140 uh, officers were... Uh, injured or assaulted. Yes, he Uh, said, I think he said over 100. I can't remember if he said 140, but I remember him saying something to the effect of over 100 were assaulted that day. And he said some with the American flag. uh, And then he said some later died. He at least didn't say they died that day because the person who died was Ashley Babbitt, as we know, you know. Um, But by the way, did you hear my response too, Susan? That was the one moment I thought, Um, Vance could I thought he answered the question uh, well by saying hey you know we're talking about the future like move on kind of thing Um, but I thought I thought when uh, Waltz brought up well Pence isn't here because you know he's no longer with Trump and that's why you're here basically it was sort of a jab Mm -hmm. to to Vance and obviously to Trump at the same time and I think he should have used that moment to say, you know why you're here, I should be debating, you know, Kamala Harris, because you guys under speak about a threat to democracy, you undermine 14 million people, and their votes didn't even matter. You just pushed out Joe Biden. It would have been a great slam, because that, to me, is such a, uh, let's talk about undermining democracy, Susan, you know, I mean, that, that would have really, really done it. Uh, thank you, Susan. You're terrific. Thanks so much. Let's go to Alan in the Bronx. Go ahead, Alan. Oh, hi, Rita. Uh, last weekend in Ann Arbor, Michigan, is college football, Michigan versus Minnesota. Terrible Timmy decides to show up and terrible Timmy gets, in into, gets into it with 
Oops, I, I saw that. I saw that apparently like what he gave like the finger to somebody or something like that happened. Uh, uh, I noticed that, which uh, wasn't wasn't good football decorum. I know exactly what you're talking about. Let's go to Sandra in New Jersey. Go ahead, Sandra. Oh, good evening. I just got back from the first night of Rosh Hashona, sat down with many people that I love, and everybody was so happy tonight, Rita, because of the performance that uh, J.D. Vance did. He was so presidential, eloquent, classy, brilliant, warm, kind, stately. Those are just some of the things that I wrote down about him. And, um, you know, we were talking about, um, what's his name again, <laughs> Jay of Walls. Um, I don't know. Look, Rita, gossip it a thousand times. If anything ever happened to us, I would want J.D. Vance to take over rather than um, Walsh. I mean, I really think this man is so smart. The way he thought on his feet, never looked down at notes. And right. Just, he was, oh, he I was great. I, I, by the way, I, I will tell you, I had dinner with J.D. Vance uh, when he was in New York. It was a while ago. It was early on, you know, in his sort of political career, if you will. I mean, he's still very new to the politics, but it was when he was running for Senate. And I'll never forget, I thought he was a really smart, very sincere, uh, very humble, actually, interesting guy. Like, sort of, I think, I felt very much like what we saw last night during the debate, because they were very, you know, cordial to each other. Uh, he was very sincere when uh, Tim Waltz brought up that his child, I think it was his son, who had seen the shooting at a school, which is obviously a horrible thing. And um, he picked up on that. You know, J.D. Vance right away before answering the next question said, first of all, I just want to say how horrible that was. What happened to your child? Um, you know, there was a, it was an honesty. And I thought that is what relayed to me when I met him, too. I thought I very much saw the J.D. Vance. Um, but I thought the Democrats have tried to vilify this guy every which way but loose. And I thought... He did a good job of sort of changing the impression of him being, you know, the boogeyman, which is the way if you turn on CNN or MSNBC. And I think anybody there watching it last night, I actually think he did a really great job. And I think there are a lot of independents out there who really will sway the election. Um, I think they were watching going, wow, this guy isn't really so bad. I mean, that's why there is an advantage to doing it you know, on a CNN or a CBS or ABC, where maybe those people aren't exposed. All they hear is Trump bad, J.D. Vance bad, uh, or J.D. Vance worse sometimes, even if depending on the the speaker, the uh, host. And I think watching it last night, I think he changed a lot of minds and they thought, wow, he's a lot more likable than this bumbling Tim Walls. Your thoughts real quick, Sandra. Real quick, two things. I wanted to say, if you notice his beautiful blue eyes and the way he would look at his audience, I was told that they saw this charm in him, this magnetism, this hypnotism. You look at him and you just stare at those eyes and they're so beautiful and blue. And that had something to do when he would look at the audience like that. You couldn't help but like him. I, I felt that anyway. A yeah, lot. Wait, you didn't find Walt sexy? No, he, you know, he was not sexy. <laughs> He reminded me of Don Rickles without the jokes because he was not funny, but he did look like him. He looked sometimes he looked very weird and and frightened. Yeah, and his, his eyeballs, eyes both- yeah, his eyeballs popping out look like a Halloween costume half the time. But he, you know you, that's a good analogy, Don Rickles without the jokes because Don Rickles told great great jokes, uh, and sadly the jokes on us if this guy gets into the White House because. Uh, boy, he couldn't even keep his story straight, which is why I think he was having trouble. And he couldn't even articulate it, which is also trouble, too. I'm talking about Tim Waltz. Uh, Sandra, thank you very, very much. We appreciate it. And now, everybody, our support, our heroes. The Rita Cosby Show presents Support Our Heroes. And this is the Tunnel to Towers Foundation Support Our Heroes segment with a powerful story from Livingston County, Kentucky, where 98 years old Charles W. Curry of that area is the last living World War II veteran in that county. The American Legion Post there in the area held a World War II Remembrance Reception to honor him and other veterans who have served our nation. 
Just to give you some background, the commander there of that post said the event is provided as a way for family, friends, and community members to learn more about Curry's powerful story. He said it's important that we capture those stories for future generations because the history books don't often have those personal stories. And you don't, you only get one perspective. And by talking to veterans firsthand, like Mr. Curry, you get the perspective of a seaman. You get the perspective from different aspects of the battles. He also said it links generations and ways for young people to understand those who have served. By the way, Curry served in the U.S. Navy from 1944 to 1946, signing up for duty at age 18. And everybody, support America's military and first responder heroes. Make a huge difference. All you have to do is donate $11 a month to Tunnel to Towers Foundation. Be sure to check them out at T2T.org. That's T2T.org. You're listening to The Rita Cosby Show. It's the Rita Cosby Show. Well, Tim Walz was fumbling and bumbling. And in the last few hours, President Trump responding to this drop. A lot of people referring to an October surprise. This is the January 6th filing. Yet another one from Jack Smith even though it's not going to go anywhere, but it is going out into the public domain. And I believe clearly election interference. We're just a few weeks, a little over a month from the election. And they put out this hit job, the smear job, President Trump calling it election interference and saying this is so preposterous, so politically charged. And again, calling Jack Smith deranged Jack Smith. The Democrats can't get January 6th out of their head. And every time that there's a fumble, like I would say the debate last night, which was definitely not good for Kamala Harris and Tim Walls, well, suddenly, surprise, surprise, let's go back to the old playbook of January 6th. 1-800-848-9222. 1-800-848-9222. Let's go to Isabel. Uh, Isabel uh, in Manhattan, go ahead. Your thoughts. Hi, Rita. President Trump cannot be blamed for January 6th because it was the Dems that refused the National Guard. You know what? That's an interesting point because Pelosi's office, uh, according to records, did refuse it. Uh, At least people in her staff clearly did. Also, some people at the Pentagon did, too. Uh, So that brings up the other question as well. So you're right. There's a lot of details there. And quite frankly, if the National Guard had come out that day, think how different January 6th would have been. And and does it sound like somebody who's out to raise hay if somebody wants to create some mob scene and some horrible things? uh, Guess what? Uh, You don't uh, start it off by saying, I'm going to bring in the National Guard to keep calm and to make sure things are safe and to make sure things go well and are peacefully and patriotically. It just defies logic. And that needs to come out, too. There needs to be the real story behind January 6th, not the Democratic spin that seems to go on and on and on, everybody. Janine Pirro here for Colonial Metals Group. Colonial Metals Group helps Americans protect their future with the most trusted store of wealth in human history, physical gold and silver. If you're retiring or retired, go to colonialmetalsgroup.com slash Pirro for your free Janine Pirro Colonial Metals Group Retirement Protection Kit or call 800-965-8004. 800-965-8004 now to receive a free home safe and up to 70 $7,500 in free silver. 